Hey, what's going on, everyone? It's Roger Sanchez. Welcome to the House Culture Podcast. House Culture. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode in our fourth season of the House Culture Podcast, hosted as ever by me, the managing editor at House Culture, Matt Rouse. I'd like to welcome all of you listeners to the House Culture Podcast. Some of you might be regulars and know your way around by now, but for those new listeners, I'd like to roll out the red carpet and introduce you to us. We are House Culture, a collective of house music fans who have come together through their mutual love of the beat to celebrate the spirit of house music. Instagram is where you can find our main party, so come and join us and over 100,000 others on a virtual dance floor where everyone is welcome. And if you haven't already, please dig through our back catalogue of incredible guests. Our most recent episode was a special interview with none other than the legendary Paul Oakenfold. If you haven't listened to that, I highly recommend checking it out. And if you want to go even further, you can catch up with the likes of Danny Tanaglia, Fatboy Slim, Purple Disco Machine, David Morales, the list goes on. This podcast is not just about the DJs and producers though, as we are house culture. We're interested in getting the thoughts of everyone related to the scene, whether it be Pike's Hotel creative director Dawn Hindle, former Mix Mag editor Dave Seaman, or the man who brought dance music to Glastonbury, Malcolm Haynes. We make sure that all of our guests have interesting stories to tell. So even if you don't recognize the name on the episode, get stuck in, as I'm sure you'll enjoy it. In this one, I was joined by a man of many names, a hit maker, party rocker and technical wizard behind the decks. To some he is known as the S-Man, but to most he is the one and only Roger Sanchez. He joined me live and direct from his studio in Miami and in our chat you'll hear how a young Roger fell in love with DJing while studying architecture at college. I was uh, full-time in college so I was DJing kind of on the weekends and I started selling mixed tapes on Broadway in Manhattan to kind of make some additional money, but also to kind of get my name out. And what I noticed was that I had a far easier time diving into music than I did trying to sit there and study structural strength of concrete and steel. How one of his earliest successes came together in the studio. Love Dancing was interesting because I had a bunch of vinyl that I brought with me to sample and lift bits. And then I lifted a hook from Loose Joints, um, Is It All Over My Face track. And then literally from that hook, I built the entire track around it. How he has used the new technology at his disposal to elevate the art form of DJing. For me, it went from playing tracks and just throwing like an acapella to deconstructing them in my head and then looping certain sections. So in my mind, I view uh, my sets as like one long remix session where I'm constantly layering and remixing. And how he put his number one single, Another Chance, together. But I said, okay, I want to bring in this euphoric element on top of this kind of melancholy sound. But what the line is saying is is that if I had another chance, so I, I just grabbed onto that hook because it was very poignant. And I wanted to kind of create this moment that was both bittersweet and at the same time euphoric. So here we go, the S-Man cometh. This is Roger Sanchez. House Culture. Hi, Roger. It's an absolute honor to have you join us on the House Culture podcast today. You're a DJ and producer that has been at the very center of the club culture scene since the early days. You have won a Grammy Award for your remix work, released an anthematic number one single, as well as wowed club goers across the globe with your technical mastery behind the decks. Let's go back to the beginning and hear how, growing up in Corona in Queens in New York City, how did you first discover music? Well, when I first started as a kind of a, a kid growing up in Queens, music was really very cross-cultural. I grew up in a Latin household, so there was lots of merengue and salsa music that we had in the house. My mother was definitely very a, a devout Christian, so she kind of put a little bit of a of a of a of a restrictive on that, but we still <laughs> got that in. Plus, um basically early hip hop coming through the radio waves, funk, soul, disco. So all of these things kind of really formed the kind of foundation of where my musical taste began. Mm-hmm. Um, 
I used to break dance as well. So that was kind of like I got very got into that when I was in high school. Pretty much from the age of 13, mm -hmm. I started DJing. I had a friend of mine in, in the neighborhood that we lived in who was a DJ. And he used to do these little block parties and apartment parties. And I got hooked on DJing one day. Uh, he had a little little kind of mom and dad or away party in the apartments. Let's invite all the all the guys <laughs> and girls from the neighborhood over. And he was talking to some girl. He just said, hey, listen, why don't you take over this? Um, and, uh, and that's where kind of, I got started and got mm. hooked on the whole DJing aspect of it. Um, and then immediately I started collecting the kind of, at that point, emerging, um, Latin, um, hip hop, which is known as freestyle, yeah. funk, soul, disco, mm -hmm. and really kind of getting that early dance culture sound, which was a blend and a hybrid of all of these into my system and playing them out. And then house music started coming over from Chicago, um, kind of like in my late teens, early you know, early nineteens and twenties. Um, actually, um, late 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 eighties. So it would have been like my late teens. House music started coming over, and I said mm -hmm. that I got really into that very early on. Yeah. Um, so this is kind of like you know, at the same time, I'm going to school for art and architecture, I'm writing graffiti. So this is kind of like I was really stuck into that early burgeoning hip hop scene. So that's formed the nucleus of my kind of technical side, mm -hmm. learning how to play and cut and scratch and start off with with hip hop and then mixing disco and soul into that and then kind of graduating into the whole house music movement. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and during that time in like New York City, I mean, there's like you say, a whole convergence of things with like graffiti, fashion, clubs, music, everything kind of coalescing into this new kind of form. And, you know, whether that brought in elements of like hip hop, like you say, or early house music, old bits of disco, you know, did it feel like at that stage that that was really the beginning of a movement of something? Or was it just that was just popular or popular underground culture at that time? I think uh, a bit of a combination of the two. There was this very kind of burgeoning circle of underground um, music and a scene in New York, places like the Paradise Garage, which were predominantly completely gay on one night and then mixed on another night. Mm -hmm. so the gay club culture really championed that kind of early disco and, and club and and um and house music movement very early on and there was also very there was a very strong artistic underground uh in new york that really coalesced around the sound mm -hmm. um and i think that though at the same time on a broader scale it was just starting to creep into a bit more mainstream visibility because at that point in time you know hip-hop and freestyle Latin hip hop were kind of the predominant club um, music for the more crossover commercial clubs at that point in time. So it was interesting seeing that kind of underground culture from Manhattan and the city start to then edge out to, to the outer boroughs and then grow outward and the sea start to really take off in the UK. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, you mentioned as well about going to school and studying art and architecture and things. Was that kind of the career path for you at that time um how did when, yeah. when was that crossover for music or when did that take over when it started to affect your um, studies maybe <laughs> oh yeah no listen and this is an interesting one because pretty much from 13 years old i started djing and kind of started them off as a hobby but really started getting deeper into it as i started getting into college mm -hmm. uh i studied architecture and obviously graffiti was kind of like a really big part of my artistic background. When I was in college, you know, I started off being very studious. My father's uh, an engineer, so he was very um, tough on my studies as I was growing up. What was interesting was as college started to go on, I started really diving deeper into music and my grades started slipping, as you mentioned. <laughs> and what surprised me was around my fourth year, because it's a five-year um, program, my father sat me down and said, look, grades are starting to suffer and I see you spending a lot of time you know with this DJing and music don't be an architect because you think it's going to make me happy you have to choose your own career path and what makes you happy so if you love this DJ thing you never know you might be the best DJ in the world you know you need to do what's right 
for you. Mm -hmm. Totally shocked me because I expected him to say, drop that piece of garbage, it'll go nowhere, you know, <laughs> get serious, get a real job. But what that did for me was it gave me my own internal permission to really seek what it is that was calling me. And mm -hmm. I said, okay, I'm going to take a year off from school. And if it doesn't really work out, and you know, then I, I can always go back to college and finish my last year, you know, and then here we are today. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, it looks like uh, it was really meant for me. And the, the moral for me with that one was always encourage your children to follow their dreams and their hearts, not anything you, there's so many people I hear that get no support from the parents with what they want to pursue. And I'm like, you really need to pursue what's in your heart because you dedicate yourself and you put the effort into something that really you love as opposed to doing things that, you know, society says or you will make your parents happy that that rarely ever works out. Totally, totally agree. And that support, like you said, they're surprising as well, especially if your your father was very studious and, you know, to get that support, that sounds, you know, it's really, really incredible parenting. Like I've got two young kids myself and it's very, very easy just to be like, no, you should be doing this. That's kind of an easy way yeah. to parent, isn't it? It's like, actually, no, if they want to do something that they're passionate about, they're going to give it their all and go for it. Why not? A hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, when you were, when you got that, initial like you say internal permission to kind of go for it like how old were you at that time would you say uh i think that was about probably about 20 years old okay 19 20 yeah so i mean at that stage you already had a bit of a sideline in terms of a career djing what what was kind of the background in terms of what was happening at that point i was uh full-time in college so i was djing kind of on the weekends mm -hmm. and um i started selling mixed tapes on broadway uh, Manhattan, kind of around that period of time on the weekends to kind of make uh, some additional money, but also to kind of get my name out. Uh, and what I noticed was that I had a far easier time spending an inordinate, disproportionate amount of time diving into music than I did trying to sit there and study <laughs> structural strength of concrete and steel. Uh, <laughs> And mind you, I love architecture and design, mm -hmm. uh, just the kind of other far more nuanced aspects <laughs> of it just really didn't appeal to me, man. I'm just like, yeah, I'm good at math, but I really can't stand these calculations. <laughs> it's not doing it for me. Um, and, and that really was when, I, when, when everything kind of came to head and I had that conversation. But because I was a full-time student, mm -hmm. then dropping out of college said, okay, now... I'm going to focus all my attention on that and also, you know, getting other kind of sideline jobs to support my main job. Now, now then everything inverted, mm -hmm. uh, went through a bit of a, a hard period of, of time of not really having any money at all. And I called it the, my skinniest and my thinnest <laughs> moments. Um, sometimes I'm like, okay, I just need to go back to that one hot dog a day diet. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was really formative. Mm -hmm. in terms of the hustle aspect of it because mm -hmm. you grind hard when you you know have food on your table <laughs> and my dad was like okay you made that choice great now you go get it yeah if you need my help i'll only give it to you in the direst emergency than you because my father had to do the same thing mm -hmm. he had a scrub he had a struggle and scrape and that impetus to really push yourself is the is the main ingredient i think for actually being successful yeah um so sometimes you got to be a little hungry yeah sometimes. and you need the fear as well don't you it's that you, you know you need Absolutely. that you, you haven't got anything to fall back on apart from yourself at that stage so you got to make it happen that's right no mommy daddy <laughs> buying you bailing you out i didn't have that no so, which is no. good yeah and uh you know you mentioned selling mixtapes on broadway and things like that so you know what were you put what were you putting on there was it your own dj mixes were you producing anything at that stage you're obviously hustling and, you know, what was even doing that? Was it legal? Were you getting chased down by the cops well, or whatever? I, I, I was definitely getting chased by the cops because I didn't have a permit to sell on, on Broadway as a vendor. Not to mention the, you know, I was doing DJ mixes. So, you know, but technically it really was bootlegging. So I'm pretty <laughs> sure there was some some tracks that probably, it was never at the volume that, you know, of like hundreds of thousands that would have really um, impinged upon some real royalties. But regardless... Mm -hmm. You know, it was me doing these different mixtapes 
uh, different types of sounds, predominantly house, but then it was like more underground house, more tribal, um, some hip hop tapes. So, but it was focusing on showcasing my DJing career, uh, my DJing um, skills. And then really we, we, with that, I started kind of putting together this nucleus of, of people to hand out flyers. And I started taking the money from the, the CD, from the cassette sales, and then putting them towards bar guarantees at clubs to throw my own events. Mm-hmm. And in the beginning, you know, talk about young kids who didn't want to drink. So everybody was, you know, coming to the club and buying water. So I kind of lost money in the beginning, but it built up a following steadily in New York City. And I think that, you know, plus having the promo, the promo team, the street teams mm-hmm. um, really helped me build that kind of local community around what I was doing. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, one of your first nights that you used to run was Ego Trip at, um, at Mars. I mean, That's right. what what music were you playing there? Was it similar to like, obviously, the mixtapes that you're putting together? Yeah. Mars, um, Ego Trip was definitely about the most underground sounds um, that I could possibly have with other than house music. And it was just super, you know, real niche, real underground. It was all about the dancers on the floor and what I call the circle children. They used to like to, to kind of dance in a circle and, and battle each other very much. Um, if I had to kind of give you um, a sonic kind of marker, it was kind of like a lot of stuff that would have been coming out of like Glasgow, um, deep New York house, a lot of strictly rhythm stuff. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of like the early formative sounds, new groove, yeah. um, early kind of tracks, international and uh rather tracks and dj international that was kind of like the real sound of that mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and did you find that this that was a success and that was beginning to open doors with you like getting more of a you know the community like you say in the community and support and everything like that that name recognition absolutely the the basement parties in mars started off at like a 50 capacity room um and then that quickly became packed so then i started um moving out moving out to other different venues and then it went to like 100 200 250 cap to the point where then um one of the local djs was really big in the kind of crossover scene named roman ricardo approached me and he had taken over promoting this venue called the octagon mm-hmm. which was like a 2000 cap venue in manhattan and he approached me and said look i love what you've been doing and i see you know at that point in time my record love dancing had been out and was very successful in the mm-hmm. underground i was really he was really making my name known that plus the mixtapes. And he said, why don't you come on and be my partner? Uh, and we'll, you know, I'll partner up with you and let's do this Saturday night. He needed somebody that had that kind of street credit and that following to kind of add to his following. Mm-hmm. And we did a run for probably about almost a year, um, Saturday nights and we would pack out after octagon. And from then on, it was every, any event that I would do in New York was always packed. You know? yeah. So that was really, that, that kind of early that early growth period in New York City and this is about the time when my track Love Dancing had really mm-hmm. taken off and I had started doing remixes mm-hmm. um, for different artists so all of that was happening kind of simultaneously so I guess my dad was right <laughs> <laughs> absolutely I mean I want to talk about Love Dancing specifically obviously Underground Solution that's you it's on Strictly Rhythm to this day, I think it still sounds like such a groove. It's still, you know, timeless in that way and still can, you know, I've heard it played on numerous dance floors at different stages of the night and it's always worked. I mean, just take us through kind of creating that. Was it like, you know, was it really difficult to put together or was it just like one and done? You were like inspired in the studio one day. So the interesting thing is that at that point in time, the first record that I actually had released was on my own label through Quark Records, and it was called Ego Trip, mm-hmm. um, Dream World. Mm-hmm. Gladys Pizarro was the A&R director of Strictly Rhythm, which is a new label, and Quark and Strictly Rhythm were in the same building. There were a few labels in the same building, and I used to run around Manhattan to all the record labels like New Groove, Strictly, and pick up promos. Mm-hmm. Um, and then at that point in time, I was a billboard reporting DJ. So then they started just sending me stuff. So in my rounds, I got to know the A&R directors and all the people. And when Ego Trip came out, I went one day to pick up some promos. And Gladys said, hey, I love that Ego Trip record. Why don't you do something for us? And I'm like, great. She goes, okay, I'm going to book a studio for you. You go in there and see what you come out with. So she booked the studio for me. And I think it was 
the third track and the first couple of tracks I did were very, very deep, very kind of, you know, um, two, like 4 a.m. moody um, type of tracks. Mm -hmm. uh, and then Love Dancing was interesting because I had a bunch of tracks that I a bunch of vinyl that I brought me to sample and take like lift bits. And then I, la I lifted a, a hook from Loose Joints. Um, is it all over my face track? And then from that, literally from that hook, I built the entire track around it. And, my, and then I, I was using, at that point in time, a Yamaha drum machine. We were on an Atari computer, Juno 106 bass line. So I started putting all these elements together and really came up with the groove really very, it kind of flowed effortlessly at that point in time. The engineer played this kind of flute um solo in the middle he was an engineer and a keyboard player yeah um, and i remember this was in like a studio in somebody's apartment on 52nd street in manhattan i don't know how the hell they they got away with like soundproof in the studio <laughs> that was like in the middle of some of a straight up residential apartment building mm -hmm. but you know love dancing came out of that and then gave it handed it into to gladys and then it took off from there yeah, I mean, we've spoken to Gladys on this podcast as well. And, you know, she's nothing but good things to say about that track specifically and about, you know, how how it was a major success in the early years of Strictly Rhythm as well and really made a difference for, for that label kind of starting out. I mean, you know, looking back on that now, do you still feel kind of a bit of pride in that track? and um, Or is it something sometimes people can look back and be like, oh, it's not really me anymore, you know, I, I've moved on from that sound. You know, how do you... How how do you look at it these days? I, I, I look at it as, as one of my children. It's kind of the way I look at all of my tracks. So, uh, but I, I, I'm very, I'm proud that, that, that I call myself a conduit. So I kind of have this, um, this kind of theory that these ideas are kind of floating in the ether and they choose who to come through. So in a way it's a bit of a blessing and it helps me kind of keep my ego in check. It's like, okay, I was chosen to let, to have this track particularly come through. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm very blessed and fortunate that that happened to me. And that track is really uh, to this day forms a, a major building block across everything else that I've done and the creative decisions that I've taken. But that really kind of um, is incredibly formative for me. And then, you know, the people that supported me at that point in time, Tony Humphreys was very instrumental in breaking that record in New York at that point in time. So I've got to give a lot of thanks to people that were very supportive, especially in my early days of my career. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, uh, is there ever a temptation to bust it out every now and again? Do you still get a request for it here and oh, there? Oh, I do. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I, def I definitely drop it every so often. And I think... Um, there are certain sets that I, I find are the right sets to, mm -hmm. to, to, to really drop in, especially when I go into my classic house sets, then that, that really kind of fits in that zone. And it, then it kind of is part of the story of yeah. where I'm at. Yeah, no, it's totally still works. I mean, and you mentioned about how that blew up and it led to other pro production work, uh, remix work, you know, what, what was happening then? Was it suddenly like a tidal wave and you're like, wow, this is, things are really moving now. It was interesting because at that point in time, I was, um, as I said, a billboard reporting DJ, which means I would submit my charts in and that would be part comprised part of what was the, the dance chart for billboard. Mm -hmm. um, so I was getting contacted by a lot of promoters on a weekly basis, pushing their records. And it, then they started contact, the A&R started contacting me after Love Dancing. Yeah, uh, yeah. The very first track I remixed was uh, a track called Mainline, by a group called Tribal House that had had a song called Motherland out earlier, which was a big underground success. Uh, and I did that track. Uh, and that remix then sparked the chain of like a really long run of remix that just kind of snowballed. And all of a sudden I was just getting called all the time and hit up to do remixes from different artists. And at that point in time, I was kind of managing myself and just taking, you know, <laughs> creating stenotype invoices to send out to people <laughs> for remixes and for bookings but it it then really started taking off and um i had gone on my first tour with strictly rhythm in the uk my very first uk tour mm -hmm. was uh when love dancing was licensed to i think it was 10 records at that point in time okay. that kind of really began my uk connection mm -hmm. and real exposure and, and kind of you know, prominence of what we do, guys like myself and Todd Terry, who I actually went on that tour, my very first tour with Todd. That's where we kind of really 
started exploding that scene coming from New York to there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, were you surprised? Obviously, New York was its own thing and had its own scene. Were you surprised to come over to the UK and see things kind of happening here, maybe in a in a different kind of way or the same? What what were the comparables there? I think for me, going to the UK for the very first time was like discovering a different world because <clears throat> there were definitely different cultural differences between the US, New York specifically, and the UK. But the um, the way that the people embraced the sounds in the clubs were just next level. So I really kind of felt a kinship because I really felt like, okay, here's a place where house music really, really is very, very you know potent and it's really growing. So I I felt that connection immediately once I came over. Yeah, yeah, and I mean, you know, and then from there, obviously, the UK onwards, were you going around Europe and other places around the world? Uh, you know, what were the differences there? Were you still surprised at this burgeoning scene? Yeah, I think, you know, in the early days, Italy was really one. Italy was a very big market, so was Spain. Mm -hmm. So I started seeing these other parts of Europe really embracing the sound of what we we're doing. Uh, then I started going over to Japan. And Japan was was amazing for the the kind of early days of house music as well, and just kind of seeing how really into the music the fans were, <laughs> and how they really kind of you know they recognized some of these tracks and were really one hundred percent into them, it just kind of made it that much more um, exciting to continue playing and producing and. and going around the world and kind of spreading this. Yeah, yeah. And you obviously mentioned Todd Terry there as well. And I mean, you know, he's been there since the, the beginning as well. Like when you first went on that tour with him, was he already someone that you kind of looked up to? Or 100%. did he take you under his wing? And, you know, how, what was the, <laughs> the dynamic between the two of you? So Todd was someone who at that point in time had had massive hits with um, tracks like Can You Party?, party people um he had had uh a house you mm -hmm. so he was really a big name in, in the house music scene and for me it was interesting because he'd also had a reputation of being somebody really moody and just kind of like i don't like anybody get out my face <laughs> which he showed to a couple of people while we were on the on the tour but with me we really connected and he kind of really sat me down he goes look you know what i like you let me tell you there's a couple of things you need to do to to be successful. And here's what you should be doing moving forward. And you should be doing this. You should hit this person up. You should be in the studio doing this and then have put these tracks together, come out here and then make this money. <laughs> so I was like, and then make, and everything ended in and make this money. <laughs> so, so to this day, we remain great friends. And I give him a great credit for really kind of giving me a mentoring that early that early part of my career and kind of directing things yeah. in the sense of pointing out that's where you that these are things you need to do and here are places you need to hit um and he was great for that and then also but like i said the funniest thing for him was the funniest thing with him was being in this situation where i see him people pissing him off <laughs> and promoters kind of like really getting under his skin and threatening to kill people <laughs> so it was really funny <laughs> <laughs> amazing and uh like i saw on your instagram the other day that you were like back to back with him recently and yes. you know i mean yes. how special are those sets for you now considering you know the friendship that you've got they're they're, they're amazing and it's funny because when i when i play with todd I, I know what i know todd's frame because todd's always been one of these guys that plays todd you know he's got his sound he that's that's what he plays so mm -hmm. with me i kind of break him out a little bit of, of that kind of, you know, where he's normally at, but then he brings in his style and, and his flavor to it. So I, we really complimented. And we did that one kind of impromptu at Glitterbox at Tomorrowland mm -hmm. a few years back before the pandemic. Um, and it was just kind of like a spontaneous, like, you know, he, his, I felt bad because his set was when the time when it was in the main act, but it emptied out his tent. I'm like, why don't you just play with me for a little while? And we just freestyled it. And it, went off people went nuts so yeah, it was great yeah. awesome and you know obviously i mentioned at the top of the interview as well like you're 
you're a real like technical master behind the decks like just watching you in action you can tell that you've really thought about you know you see you seem to have 150 things going on at once <laughs> and everything's working and everything's in time and it just blows my mind every time I see it and I mean like how do you kind of keep that skill set up is it playing live all the time is it practicing you know and knowing your tracks you know how how do you keep all that in in one easy flow for you well it's interesting because i feel like my style has developed over the years i really got very technical early on Mm -hmm. especially with playing hip-hop and cutting and scratching and then getting deeper into kind of club music and house music i started really focusing on layering and, and adding a third deck so Early on, I was one of the guys coming over to the UK and playing on three decks when not a lot of people were doing that. Mm-hmm. Um, and with the transition with the technology to CDJs and then to using USBs, um, as the technology developed, I've also been very involved with Pioneer and kind of you know, helping them um, by you know advising them on a lot of their products. Uh, I saw where it was going and I was able to kind of really wrap my head around the tech and then I started adding a fourth deck to things. And for me, it went from playing tracks and just throwing like an acapella to deconstructing them in my head and then looping certain sections. So in my mind, I view uh, my sets as like a rem- uh, like one long remix session where I'm constantly layering and remixing. So I really became very organized on how I categorize my music, create loops, you know, set up a cappella templates so that I know where to find it. And I never know what I'm going to play mm-hmm. ever before I go on to a set. I rarely have, you know, pre pre set up a, an actual set. But what I do have is I have more of um an idea of the vibe. And then when I'm there, that usually ch- tends to change a little bit. Whereas I start, you know, really reacting to what the crowd and the vibe of the crowd is. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I'll just start pulling from what I have and really remix things right right on the fly. And that's kind of really what's been the development of my style. Mm. Um, organization, and I spend a lot of time really going through tracks, um, downloads, creating some of my own original kind of loops and beats to, to have so that I can layer it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's really where how I keep it organized. And then I just vibe and see what's happening on the floor. I've gotten, I've gotten comfortable with the technology to the point where I can kind of really dial into once I know where everything is at, I can make decisions and change midstream yeah. um, fairly quickly if I need to. Yeah. Like, like you say, being highly organized and having access to it all or at the touch of your fingertips, knowing where all of that is just in the moment must make it so much easier. It's definitely useful, and I think that the more organized I get, the the easier it is. Because now it's no longer – before, when I used to play on vinyl, it was very much visual. Mm-hmm. Um, I could see a cover. I know which track it is. Now with, I have a, my entire library on a USB. So there's a lot of information to, to go through. And if I don't organize myself, then I'm just going to be looking at names on a page and be like, I don't know what I'm looking at other than <laughs> – and then I'll and then I'll just go to the things that I've that I've known forever, and and mm-hmm. I try to break myself out of that. Yeah, that's that's a good good uh, ethos to have. And I mean, you know, you're talking about looking at the vibe in the club, and when you're playing these gigs, if you have the time, do you offer? Do you like to get there early and kind of sense what's go, which way it's going, and seeing what the other DJs are doing, or do you just like to parachute in and do your thing? I tend to get in a little bit earlier because I like to see where the vibe is before I go on at least 20, 20 minutes, 30 minutes before I go on, even if I'm backstage or I'm just kind of like, you know, on the side, I'm kind of checking out, seeing what the reaction is, how the DJ is setting the tone. If he's going to be playing some things that uh, I might, I might play. I don't like to repeat tracks. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, I'm like, if he's played a big record, I'll be like, yep, that's one crossed (laughs) off the list. Um, So, uh, and then I just reset my mind so i might have this is why i i I always walk into uh any set uh, any any event and i don't have a preset list of what it is that i'm going to play but i have a general sense of it so that way i could 
just really readjust on the moment yeah yeah and just watching you in action like the movement the the, the what you're doing across all of the four decks in the mixer it's like it's you, there it could be a silhouette and people would know that it's you just because of the way it moves <laughs> thank you yeah it's, it, I, I like doing things to be as expressive of, of what's on my mind as much as possible and i find that expresses itself through a style yeah absolutely and you know i want to talk to you about um ibiza and obviously you know i think well the, this season in 2022 it's going to be a big one obviously we've been locked down for a couple of years things have happened oh, yeah. sporadically um i mean before we come on to like what's going on this year uh, you know you've got a long association with the island uh, you know, you've held down residencies at like Pasha Amnesia, the gone but not forgotten space. Uh, I mean, can you tell us about your kind of first experience with that island, whether it was going as a DJ, a clubber, just on holiday? What what, what had you heard and what did you think? Um, before going to Ibiza, I would heard a lot about Balearic Sound and Paul Oakenfold and, and some of the other UK DJs. It was predominantly what I call UK rated or more like uh uh the uk had really built inroads into ibiza in terms of developing this kind of club scene even though there was a local scene there um my very first time playing in ibiza was i believe 1995 and it was with cream mm -hmm. and the first place i played was what was then known as coup uh, which is now privilege mm -hmm. and i had not I didn't have a lot of information of what the island itself was like, but when I got there, it really resonated with me because of my Latin background and kind of reminded me of, of in parts of being in the Dominican Republic when like where I was when I was young, um, going on holidays with family. So the language and the culture of the island immediately resonated with me. And then the the club nights were magical. I mean, it was just the juxtaposition of having that island, um, the kind of nature, and then at the same time, this really kind of cutting edge club culture was very unique. Mm -hmm. And um, after playing, and then when I played at at at, at, Coup at that point in time, I just remembered I, I had the I had a later set, and as the sun was rising, the roof opened up. So that was when they 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 had the roof mm -hmm. that opened up at Coup during sunrise session so it was just like wow this is something different <laughs> um and that just kind of really imprinted on me and then i started coming over more frequently i started playing for um different nights i remember i'd um i played pacha for ministry of sound uh i was doing um nights at space afternoons in space you know the kind of um when space was doing the, the mid afternoon thing, yeah, um, and that really developed into moving forward. When I started doing my own release yourself events, which really began the very first ones were at El Divino. Mm -hmm. um, that's where um, I had initially done a, a, a residency with um, what was the name of the of the uh, the series out of the UK, not God's Kitchen. Um, they, they they had a they had a club in Sheffield. Uh, oh, a gate crasher. Gate crasher. Mm -hmm. Gate crasher. So I believe it was gate crasher. We did three. Yes, and we did three gate crasher residencies that were my Roger Sanchez gate crasher. And then from there, I started. I had started already my release yourself shows in the UK on Kiss, mm -hmm. and um, then I was approached to do. So why don't we do your own residency? Uh, and then I started off at El Divino because I was, it, it was it was me playing at Pacha quite a lot and at um, Space. So I started off initially at, at El Divino. And then that year was the year that I had done uh, another chance and another chance had just gone massive. Mm -hmm. So that kind of really cemented the, the residency. And then uh, the year after that, I moved uh, to Monday nights at Pacha. Yeah, yeah. And I want to talk to you about um, another chance as well. The, um, you know, it's 
just well last year was its 20th anniversary and you know one, one of Crazy your to think that. one of your kids is like graduating from from college probably now uh, we'd like that, that if oh, you're yeah. tre- treating these tracks as children um i mean like they, obviously it samples toto uh, like how familiar were you with that sample before you took it into that track is it something that you always had in mind to use or something you discovered like how did that come about yeah. Toto, obviously, I was a fan of from the song Africa, but um, the way that particular track came about, I had gone vinyl shopping after one of my gigs in Montreal, and I used to go to these bargain basement vinyl um, warehouses, uh, and no matter where I went, Japan, any place, they had like a vinyl shop on there. And, you know, I would do my beat, my beat mining, so hunting. So I bought a bunch of vinyls, and that album from Toto was on it. And as I was working through my album, initially I got signed to Sony mm-hmm. in the UK for the album deal. And then the Sony dance division collapsed uh, as I was kind of mid flow with my album. Simon Dunmore then said, hey, listen, um, we had a long relationship. He'd given me lots of remixes. We developed a really good friendship. Um, he then said, I'm, I, why don't I take over the album? I, you know, I, I really want to get behind this. Mm-hmm. And he took over the a of it. The last track on the album that I did was another chance. And in my mind, I was like, okay, I just need one more underground track on the album. Mm-hmm. I feel like I'm missing that. Um, and I'm just kind of going through samples and, and collecting ideas. And then I came across that ballad, which I'd never really played before. Mm-hmm. At that point in time, it was interesting because um, not too long prior to that, my I had a, my manager was my best friend at that point in time had passed away, Mars Andrews. Mm-hmm. So as I found that hook, it just kind of gave me this kind of melancholy vibe, which I really found very bittersweet but interesting. And I'm like, okay, let me take that hook, and I created a track that kind of around it. But I said, okay, I want to bring in this euphoric element on top of this kind of melancholy sound, but but what the line is saying is, is that if I had another chance, so I, I just thought I just grabbed grabbed onto that hook because it was very poignant, mm-hmm. and I wanted to kind of create this moment that was both bittersweet, you know, and at the same time euphoric, mm-hmm. and it just kind of came together like that. And I had a uh, my my friend who was a guitar player come in and play that kind of like Patrick Swayze inspired. <laughs> breakdown and just kind of remember like she's like you know she's like the wind that was really like my very 80s moment in that middle of the break and there was something about the track that kind of always gives me that 80s feel Mm -hmm. um but really kind of putting it together and i was like okay great i got another underground track on the album no clue what it was gonna do and when i handed it to 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 simon and he heard Mm -hmm. that one I've learned to read Simon since then. So I know, because he's very good at kind of trying to be like, yeah, it's all right, it's not bad, it's cool, it's cool, it's cool. He likes to really downplay things. Meanwhile, he's doing backflips and cartwheels in his head. And I look back, I'm like, he's like, yeah, this is something. Mm -hmm. He chose that as the first single Mm -hmm. from the album. And then, you know, they just took off from there. Yeah, yeah. I said, you know, number one here in the UK as well. And I think, like, off the top of my head, I can't think of... I, I maybe should have done the research on that bit beforehand. Another defected number one single before that, to be honest, it must have been their first, I think. That was yeah. the very first defected number one single. Yeah, that was actually the very first one they've had. And there was, I remember him telling me, he's like, you know, um, he called me and he goes, got something to tell you. I'm like, what? He goes, we're number one this week. I'm like, really? He goes, yeah, it's our first one. I'm like, wicked. <laughs> well done. So, I mean, from that point on, you know, you've got As to you tick do. the boxes in terms of like, you know, I suppose you're on top of the pops and like massive mainstream kind of starts knocking at your door. The merry-go-round. Like, yeah, how did that... The hamster wheel. Yeah, was that a sudden change in terms <laughs> of the mainstream? It was a real big shift in terms of where I come from and kind of how I'd moved in the music business at that point in time. I had a lot of exposure, but from the club version of it, growing up with, <clears throat> like growing into it with remixes so on and so forth, mm-hmm. that literally felt like the hamster wheel because there was a period of about two weeks where it was morning radio, top of the pops, never mind the buzzcocks. Um, all, all of these very kind of culturally iconic things in the UK that I've always seen pop stars do. And in my mind, I'm not a pop star. Uh-huh. So I'm kind of in this pop star going like, you, you, you guys do know I'm a DJ. I'm not going to sing here and I'm not going to dance for you guys. 
but it just kind of, you know, on, you know, Sky News and different things like that. So it was really interesting for me, exhausting <laughs> at this, just that, that, that hamster wheel of like press and promo. And this is where I was like, I'm, I'm so glad I was never in a boy band. <laughs> so thing. I couldn't imagine having to do this at like 17 years old and yeah. just not stop and what, how that warps your reality. Mm. It was very, very cool, but it also is different from how I approach that, mm -hmm. you know, now, but, but it's interesting because what it's done for me is it's given me perspective on yeah. how that, you know, to go in kind of like the pop crossover zone, what that requires, and then doing things on my own accord. And it's also changed from now to then because of social media and everything else. So everything is very skewed. But at that point in time, it was just like, you know, tidal wave of 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 things to do that I was just like, holy cow, this is exhausting. And I'm <laughs> used to I'm used to being tired of flying and all that. This is next level. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, like you say, it's probably good to have had like a little bit of a taste of that, an example of like what the world is like if you want to lean into that. But yeah, it just sounds, I'm exhausted just hearing about that, to be honest. It sounds crazy. Um, and, and things like, in terms of things changing very, very quickly and, you know, the hamster wheel and that kind of thing, you know, it came to like an abrupt halt, really, the, the pandemic and, you know, and you were one of the first, you know, DJs to um, lean into kind of the streaming side of things and with your Twitch channel and live streams and getting a whole community together as, as well. Like, was that some, when the pandemic happened, was that, an immediate plan uh, like and how did that initial pandemic period kind of happen for you i think for everyone we're completely caught by surprise mm. now mind you you know pandemics haven't his historically happened every hundred years or so so we were due for it and in fact several years prior if you really look back mm. we've been warned that this is coming an airborne virus is coming you know this has been kind of we've been prepped for this uh, but nobody was paying attention the nightlife industry in particular was extremely hard hit and we got the least support from the government compared to everybody else. So it was really a very um, eye opening and a tough period of time. There was a lot of other stuff going on, but that, that what happened at that point in time is like literally everything stopped and then the bills kept coming <laughs> and we were locked behind doors then you know everybody was like yeah you know we'll, we'll just quarantine for a couple of weeks and you know i just remember seeing all these promoters going yeah you know we'll you know it's march and june we should be fine and i'm thinking to myself really looking at this i'm like guys we're screwed mm. this shit is going to go on for a while which then when actual quarantine was so surreal it just kind of like i'm like okay so i'm now in the middle of a disaster movie this is basically a disaster movie scenario you know i am legend type shit mm -hmm. so it's interesting because when that happened i didn't have the initial plan of streaming that really wasn't so much something that i had been focusing on mind you twitch has been going on for quite some time um but as we were all locked behind our doors i became increasingly aware of the disconnect and what people were hungering for because they're where everyone's locked inside and, and dancing and, and and communicating when you're forced to be separate you really miss that communication so i really kind of leaned into it as a response to just continue to connect and then realizing you know and you know there was um down the road monetizing it became something that you know became more possible but in the beginning it was just like let's just play and mm -hmm. you know i had moved down to miami it was in, literally had started building my studio which basically became a giant storage room for a while because we couldn't do anything mm -hmm. so i just moved the equipment in here and my fiance and i were in our apartment thankfully we have a lovely view and but you know it, you know i wasn't in new york which is where i was normally from thankfully i was here in miami already and you know we actually had good weather and we were one of the first ones to open but it became kind of a thing of like, let me broadcast from here and really connect mm -hmm. um, as best as I possibly can. So it wasn't pre-planned, but I tend to re I tend to adapt and overcome. It's kind of a very Marine Corps uh, mentality that I have with that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I mean, the community that you you built up through that period. How do you see yourself operating with that 
now we're moving the world is opening up again do you you know do you see streaming as another way to interact with them for the future or do you think it was just something that would happen during the pandemic well i think it's something that was brought to light during the pandemic mm-hmm. uh i think that streaming definitely has an audience and as you think about it a lot of the older audience that have come up who don't go out anymore because they've got kids they're just not in the scene anymore one thing that i've discovered is especially on twitch the demographic tends to be older now that they've oh, yeah. discovered it and they can actually see a lot of the djs and a lot of um my twitch sets i do um are called from the booth i have these different um stream categories where i'll do you know um live from 305 which is me here in miami from the booth um and as my touring really really is ramping up now um i i'm gonna have less time to do live live streams because mm-hmm. my between that working on between touring working on a new album and a bunch of other things that i'm doing i'm finding that my tour schedule although i had i did definitely manage to restructure a bit um and instead of just going total hamster wheel which is kind of like how i felt the past 25 years 30 <laughs> years have been in terms of touring mm-hmm. i'm a lot more structured and i have a team now that really really helps me uh, I'm going to be doing more from the booths, but what what's really cool is that kind of brings people that are not able to go to the club into the club environment from my booth view. So I that I found that that's really been connecting with people. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned about the older demographic as well. It's something that you know I don't get to go out as much as I used to, and I love it. I, I absolutely loved like getting that that window into all of the behind the scenes stuff as well. It's a real, real eye opener, especially how people, different people, are approaching it in different ways. And yeah, and you know the talent was shining through. Um, I mean, another thing that you you do amongst all of your production and everything else is your podcast. Um, obviously you're talking to to me on on this podcast but you do your own release yourself one you know I, I know what it takes to put this together for me um and house culture and it's like we're only on you know we're on double figures at the moment you've done over a thousand episodes this is you know crazy it's like how long has that been going and um, where can people listen to it and what tell me about the format i've been doing release yourself now I think we're on 1069 is the new episode. Um, so I've been doing this for, um, I'm trying to remember exactly how many years it's, it's, I started my releases of radio show mm-hmm. from subbing in for Pete Tom. Mm-hmm. And then that's when Kiss um, literally approached me to say, let me do your own show. And I started podcasting literally right from there. So better part of, I would say the better part of like 15, 16 years now, probably. Yeah. yeah. Something like that. So yeah. um, it is something that I do every week. Mm-hmm. I kind of program my life according to things that I know I, I need to, I want to do. And being organized really, really helps me. So I, I put in that time. That's my DJ podcast. I do another podcast, um, which is not on as regularly but I tend to try to record as many as I can to store them up and then release them called the hustle Mm -hmm. me interviewing kind of similar to what you're doing, interviewing people in the industry. That to me was kind of me testing out what I call my, my Joe Rogan moment, kind of really trying to (laughs) go with that gold standard of interaction and and have conversations. Mm -hmm. Um, And what's interesting is just exploring different ways to really connect with people. Uh, And I find that I really enjoy it. But again, that's something else that, has to be structured in and i can't do that one as much as i would like to because i have so many other things going on so i try to schedule that one but the release yourself podcast and and radio show because it's terrestrial as well as being a podcast that's every week (laughs) yeah this relentless and yeah i mean i have listened to the hustle as well which is like i I, you know anyone who's listening to this i you know tell them to go and seek it out because it is really good obviously norman cook's been on on your one as well he's been on this one yes um and yeah listen to the sam divine one as well which is really good so yeah enjoyed it you should definitely definitely get those back up and going again you've got you've got a fan oh yeah we've got we've, we've got another couple more in the can but um um i'm probably going to re um kind of relaunch that series mm-hmm. what i've been looking at is whether i want to launch it almost as a via twitch in a way mm-hmm. so i'm kind of like experimenting what different formats to try it on so I'm, i might do that as a twitch 
stream and then podcast the stream. So yeah, yeah, we'll see. absolutely. And um, you know, in terms of this 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 podcast, this show, this is this episode is going to go out, I think, in August. Um, so what? Uh, you mentioned a new album as well that you're working on. What can you kind of talk yes. about what's going on in 2022 beyond that period that we, we can get excited about? I started working on the album last year, um, just kind of lead, started off the summer prior to the summertime, really focusing in on, you know, I've been threatening to do another album for years, <laughs> I like to say. So I just kind of the ideas really started coalescing, especially kind of during pandemic and post pandemic. So then I started just putting ideas together. Um, so far, I've got some really cool collaborations. Um, the idea is kind of like to wade through a spectrum of my sound. So there'll be some stuff that's more um, electronic, some stuff that's more disco flavored house. So I'm really kind of allowing myself to stretch in there. I've, I've done collaborations with like um, Mel C. There are a lot of writers that I got together with. Um, and some people that we, we've been talking about collaborating and we just haven't lined it up mm -hmm. uh, yet. Very song driven, but I'm definitely um, going to stretch through the range and spectrum of my sound. So it's kind of like that's really conceptually where I'm going with it. Yeah. Uh, looking hopefully to finish the production this year and then launch into 2023. Cool. And in terms of talking about music and uh, let's move on to the Spotify playlist, um, our yes. House Culture Perfect playlist. Obviously, we ask all of our guests to submit five tracks based on different themes uh, for the playlist. It's it's a huge beast now. It's, you know, it's it's over 24 hours long. It's massive. Um, and, you know, you have been great in submitting your tracks ahead of time. So I've had a look at them. I'm familiar with them all, which is always a bonus. And crucially, none, apart from one, uh, but that's one of the, the, towards the very end, is already, the none are in the playlist already, which is a definite bonus. Um, do you want me, as I kind of, as we go through this, the themes, do you want me to remind you what you've chosen or can you remember off the top of your head? I've, I've, I've got the list that I'm going to keep flashing back and forth <laughs> here just because I, I, I really kind of go off of what I'm feeling at that moment, but it's good for me to write it down. So I, I, I got it. Cool, cool. All right. So you could, you could, you could tee it up. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, I mean, in terms of a catalyst, a track that first got you into house music, electronic music, whatever, you know, what have you chosen and why have you chosen that tune? For me, one of the really early tracks that cemented my love of house music uh, was Mr. Fingers, Can You Feel It? Mm -hmm. Um, it was out on Tracks International, I believe. Um, and Larry Heard is, you know, kind of one I find one of the more overlooked geniuses of the pine and genius pioneers of house music. His fusion of jazz with electronic music really inspired a lot of my early productions, especially from Love Dancing onwards. Mm -hmm. um, the pads and the bass line of Can You Feel It? Is, is just so evocative of a, a, a mood, mm -hmm. late night underground at the same time of like seeing the, the, the it just, it's very visual for me, seeing like clouds part, sunrises. So just that baseline from the opening of just the kick and the baseline kind of fading in, mm -hmm. when the ride kicks in, that 909 ride, it just sounds, there, there's this this element of jazz, but a power mm -hmm. which immediately sucked me in. And just hearing that, and it's a very slow down tempo house track, especially compared to what what came after that in house music. But that track really just said, "Okay, I love this, and I want to be part of this." Yeah, yeah, it's it's so uh, that like flat kick it has as well. It's like there's nothing really that kind of sounds like that. It's so rolling. Unique. TR 909 <laughs> kick and, and rides and claps. I mean, that's the box that mm -hmm. launched a million careers. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Um, okay, let's move into a floor filler territory. Um, what have you chosen there? So the Deep Dish Boys, who have been friends of mine for years, have had numerous bangers and hits. This one, I think, was the one that cemented them in kind of like, oh, crap, these guys are killing it. Uh, when they did the remix to Sandy B. World Go Round. To this day, 
every time I drop that record, and I kind of I have this way of introducing it in the mix, where when that that do 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 bass line kicks in, it's literally almost every time crowds just scream and go nuts. That is an instant killer floor filler track that just never fails. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And um, okay, so let's move on to a sunsetter. Um, there are and there are like different interpretations of this track now that are really interesting in terms of like live things and jazz bands yep. and all this kind of stuff but this is the og like tell us what it is the og version <laughs> and this is um the reason i i picked it as a sunset track because i've played this at cafe mambo for part of my sunset sessions and those sessions are very special to me because most of the the pre-parties in ibiza at cafe mambo usually happen already when the sun's gone down and the party's kind of going I really got stuck into it very early on and I would do that transition from as the sun is going down to kind of start the party. Laurent Garnier, who's been a, who's also another good friend of mine, basically kind of told me when he, the reason he called this track Man with the Red Face is as he was looking at the sax player playing and his <laughs> cheeks kind of getting red, he was like, oh, I said I'm going to call this track. He just captured this really ethereal feel with the stabs that he put, the chord stab that he put, and the sax player just really takes it to another level. But I love the slow build of it. So the slow build of it as the sun goes down is perfect. And then when the beat kicks in, yeah. the trick was to kind of time it so that you had that slow beginning and then when the when the the sax peaks is when the sun has gone down and then it, then it all takes off so that's like a perfect sunset track to me oh what a description i mean yeah it just it just just raised the heart the hairs on my arms just like thinking about that yeah like you say perfect it's got that intro and then you know the the darkness comes in when it all kicks off yeah it's so good um all right a tearjerker we've already talked about the man who's done this remix um and yeah just tell us about why you've chosen this one so, I mean, there are a couple of, of, of um, very emotional connections I have with this track, mm -hmm. but the Todd Terry remix of Everything's But The Girl Missing was uh, what I call that transformative remix where he's taken, he's, he's managed to keep the initial emotional content of the song Missing, which is just um tracy thorne's voice is so mm -hmm. haunting and she's one of my favorite vocalists in this space mm -hmm. of all time mm -hmm. um and um that song just really captures the feeling of loss and missing someone for me that song actually came out when my manager passed away so mm -hmm. it was kind of really for me there's a real direct emotional connection to sadness but just as a song it's an incredibly descriptive lyric of how passing someone's door and seeing their door, but knowing that they're no longer there, whether they've moved on to another relationship or moved on from this plane mm -hmm. is powerful. Yeah. Todd was able to take that and transform that into a dance floor moment. Again, that's another bittersweet record. That's very unique and it's, it's, it's a hard skill to master yeah. and that always puts that together and every time i play whether i play the original version or even just the acapella floating over tracks it just really brings that that tearjerker moment home yeah like you say it's it's rare for a dance music track to not be you know just uplifting it's all about empowerment everyone's smiling to, to have that bit of melancholy as well it's um, yeah and still special. work as a dance floor track mm -hmm. totally totally um okay a last tune this is you've given me two choices here I gave you two choices. <laughs> but one, one, one is very self-serving so i'm gonna have to, to pick one you can self-serve don't worry like however many artists and djs and whatever have interviewed for this podcast and uh, you know nine times out of ten at one of the stages they will pick one of their own tunes so don't feel like you're being on an ego trip or anything like that it's all good um You've chosen two tracks. I see what you did there. I see what you did there. You're not on the ego trip. I like that. <laughs> there you go. So um, there are two tracks, one of which is already in the playlist. However, that's not 
the one that we've talked about already so do you want to go through which ones you've chosen and um i can tell you which one's in already in the playlist uh for me i tend to save this track as my last track of the night because um generally i i, I like holding the audience there and i've I'm, I'm the kind of person that doesn't want to give the hit away until the very, very end. So obviously one of my last kind of last track of the night is going to be my track, Another Chance, mm -hmm. that because I don't play it early on, it really makes that ending track that much more emotional and it just really kind of brings it home. And it's kind of like going to see your favorite band. You, 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 you expect them to do the hit, but it's great if they give you that real real anthem hit right at the very end and then send you off home. Mm -hmm. The other one that I chose um, was a masterpiece by Sandy Rivera under the name Kings of Tomorrow and, mm -hmm. and a, an amazing vocalist who's also a great friend of mine who I truly treasure her voice, Julie McKnight. Mm -hmm. And the song is, so tell me, how do you do? <laughs> Finally, I need you. There's, I mean, those every time i even think about the lyrics to that mm -hmm. and just the, her delivery it raises the hair on my ass and i've performed with with um julian i've collaborated with we're actually going to work on another track from my album mm -hmm. um but she's just an amazing individual but her ability to capture that emotion in that song is is unique yeah and yeah. sandy is a genius so killed it on that absolutely and even when that track like first dropped you could just tell that this was as another chance as well you knew that you'd be hearing this you know there is rare to hear a dance music track that you know is not going to date and you know it's going to be heard yep. on dance floors for years to come it's truly that special um yeah i think in the playlist currently i can't remember who chose like the original version of it but certainly it's in there because we did an interview with danny tanaglia and he talked all about yeah. his his remix of that as well and what was happening in the world when he produced that remix so yeah it's got a, got a place in the playlist already um fantastic choices thank you so much for um for pulling those out of the hat in terms of wrapping this up we always ask one final question and that is that um, we are house culture and you are part of the culture of house music, an intrinsic part of it with all of your huge success and what you have contributed to the scene. Um, when you look back on what you've achieved and where you are currently, where um, how does it make you feel about what you've contributed and what's next for you? I feel incredibly blessed and humbled to have been able to be at the right place at the right time and receive the inspiration to create the things that I have that have contributed to the scene because it's so much bigger than I am. But I feel my my place and space in it. Mm -hmm. And I think I've really, I, I, was, I never was very comfortable with the kind of accolade of pioneer whatever or uh, the position of leader or what, however you want to describe that position that has been ascribed to me over the years. And I've recently really become a far, far more comfortable in it, mm -hmm. uh, mainly because I really appreciate the culture and I see the, the growth in it. And I kind of see the renewal and it's interesting enough, something like the, the pandemic, I think has really kind of reshifted the focus back to it. Moving forward, I take, the, those kind of formative years and every, and all the inspiration from that to give me more inspiration to continue to move forward, developing the sound, maintaining the core of it while allowing it to spread and, and really looking at the next generation that's coming through and learning from them and teaching them at the same time. So I kind of, I, I feel that my position is kind of I've, I've been handed the baton to mentor a lot of people moving forward, and I've been doing that throughout my career. Mm -hmm. But I also feel myself very um, much like reinvigorated to really kind of push forward and then take this to the whatever the next chapter is going to be while I'm still on this uh, planetary plane. <laughs> Amazing. That's uh, a brilliant thought to end on, I think. That's a perfect place to, to wrap it up. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Cheers. Bye. House culture. Ooh, how incredible was that, hey? I love chatting to Roger. What a highly articulate and intelligent soul he is. 
a genuine superstar. And I think you could probably hear the nerves in me on that one. I'll tell you that when we did the interview, it was when the clocks had changed and I wasn't necessarily clear what the time difference was for him in Miami. So he totally took me by surprise when he arrived on the call an hour earlier than I expected. Still, he was very kind and accommodating and I hope you enjoyed our chat. I think his Simon Dunmore impression was worth the price of admission alone. If you're lucky enough, you can catch Roger playing at numerous places in Ibiza this summer, as well as a few more dates here in the UK. So grab those tickets where you can. You can also listen to Roger's Release Yourself radio show across Mixcloud, dig into his excellent The Hustle podcast on YouTube or wherever else you get your podcasts. And I'm sure we're all very excited to hear his new album coming in 2023. We'll keep you posted on that as we hear more. Speaking of music, get yourself over to Spotify and start following the House Culture Perfect playlist. This is where you'll find Roger's stellar selection as well as all of the tunes chosen by our previous podcast guests. There is something for everyone across every genre, not just house music. So stick it on shuffle and enjoy a playlist curated for you by the biggest names in dance music. Then once you're vibing to that, please don't forget to do all of that good stuff for us. I'm talking loving, liking, tweeting, sharing, telling your friends or leaving us a review. We love to hear your feedback. And if you have some nice things to say, we'll make sure we give you a shout out on a future episode. On this one, I've got to say a huge hello to Wayne David. who got in touch to say how amazing our previous guest Paul Oakenfold was. And he couldn't wait to listen to the interview over his lunch. See? This is the wonderful thing about podcasts. You can have one of the biggest names in the scene tell you his life story whilst you're eating a nice meal for yourself. I hope it was a tasty one, Wayne. Thanks for getting in touch. And then if you don't follow us already, come and join us on our Instagram feed at HouseCultureNet or by following the hashtag TrueHouseCulture. And finally, if you want to get in touch with me, Matt Rouse, you could do that directly on Instagram at DJ Matt Rouse. Thanks for listening. Brave safe and see you next time. House culture.